Welcome to Fully Charged. It's a bit of an unusual episode, this one. First of all, as you may have noticed, I'm not Robert. Uh, but really what's different about this episode is the topic because I'm not going to be talking about energy or the future of transport or electric vehicles or any of that stuff. I'm going to be talking about the situation that we all find ourselves in at the moment, which is stuck at home. And the reason that I think it's worth having a chat about is that this feels very familiar to me. I have spent months of my life at sea doing research, scientific research, and this is all quite like living on a ship. If you've ever wondered what living on a ship is like, it's like this, except at sea you don't have internet, uh, you don't have post, and the floor moves all the time. So I quite liked living at sea, and that came as an enormous astonishment to me because I'm a proper fidget. I'm always out and doing things, and in 2009, when I first went to sea, I was terrified of being trapped in this tin can and being bored out of my mind and being the worst person on the ship because I was going to annoy everyone else by just, you know, fidgeting. And it turns out that I quite like living at sea. And so what I thought I would do is just tell you a little bit about what it's like to live at sea, a little, a few of the similarities uh, with the situation that we're all in at the moment. Um, I'm a physicist, I'm trained as a physicist, I still do physics, but I study the ocean and this is why I've got my uh, toy octopus here. This is a blue, blue ringed octopus, lives in Australia, the real ones. So, so I study the ocean surface, I use my physics to study the breaking waves and bubbles uh, that come along in big storms because they help the ocean breathe and they take they help take gas down into the ocean and then they help also bring gas up from the ocean into the atmosphere and they spit tiny particles upwards so when you uh, lift a fizzy drink to your nose and you feel it spitting tiny particles up those white caps the foam patches on the ocean are doing the same thing and those little particles are actually really important for the way that weather and climate work so that's why I go to sea for my academic research it's because we're studying things that are just too big to fit into a lab. You might make a small version that could go into a lab, but there is no substitute for being out in the middle of a big ocean in 10 meter waves. And that's the only place you're gonna get that science done to actually look at what's happening. So that's why I go there. Research ships are normally quite big. You do this on quite specialized ships. So I've been on, most of them are really big. So they're um, a minimum of 60 meters long, maybe up to 120. And I've been on ships which have had 11 scientists and about 20 crew and ships which have had 40 scientists and 30 crew so there's quite a range of possibilities and there's a few things that you learn straight away and one is that personal space really matters i don't know if you've worked this out yet in your home situations but almost without thinking about it when people walk onto a ship they effectively draw lines around the bit that's their bit because everyone has to share everything and there's so few spaces that you can actually say this is my bit so the bed where you sleep, that's your bit. It might have a cabinet next to it, that can be your bit. In the lab, if you've got some lab space, you might have a bit there. But you very quickly learn not to mess with what's in other people's spaces because the only way that people can stay sane is having a little bit of stuff, that, a little one place they know no one else is gonna mess with. So people pick up very quickly actually without anyone really telling them that personal space is really important. The first thing that is important about how ships work is that routine is essential. So on ships, the way it works is that there are very fixed meal times, and that is partly just because otherwise there'd be chaos, uh, but also because the crew who are you know running the ship, doing the important bit, have very strict shifts. And so if breakfast is at eight a.m., you are there at eight a.m. and you will not get breakfast if you and you know by eight thirty it's all gone. Uh, so there are very strict meal times which kind of fit in with the crew schedules. And that actually turns into a good thing because when you're, uh, when the when the environment looks the same all the time, it sort of feels like time isn't passing. It's always, I've sometimes felt it feels like, um, maybe what it's like in prison, that, uh, you know, nothing ever changes but meal times keep coming around. But those meal times are really important markers in your day. So um, when I find myself now doing things that I would do on a ship, having quite regular meal times at specific times is really part of that because it gives you a sense of moving through the day. Uh, on some ships, there is, uh, everything goes well and everyone gets on and, and it's all fine. Um, and on some ships, people think about the human things and on some they don't. And one of the things that really works when it works well 
is to make the weekend special, to have one or two days a week where you actually do something different. So on some ships I've been on, that's meant that a Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening meal, for example, people have, you know, not dressed up a lot, but dressed up a bit and there's it's slightly nicer food and it's just a bit more of an event. People make a bit more time to socialise afterwards. And having those markers, like a weekly invented thing to look forward to is really important. So invent some things to look forward to. When I think about the things that I do to stay sane on the ship, in relatively confined environments, exercise is number one on the list. Now, yes, I'm a fidget, but if you don't get a change of pace, it's less about the exercise itself, I think, than just changing the pace so your life isn't just this one long, long, slow kind of, you know, it's all the same. If you do some exercise, you at least change the pace. So I make sure I, I'm in the ship's gym for an hour a day. By the end of a long cruise, I hate the ship's gym. Uh, the only thing that is worse than going is not going. But it does help a lot and making yourself do the exercise, don't let the excuse get to you that it's dark and oh, I'm, you know, I'm a bit tired today. Go and do something, even if, you know, go for, go for a walk, we're allowed to go for a walk. Make sure you get out and take exercise because it does make an enormous difference because if you don't have that change in pace, it gets harder to sleep and then it all goes wrong. So, so I am really rigid about getting exercise every day and I have done circuits in uh, the holds of ships in the um, in Ant near Antarctica actually and it's really interesting because you do sit-ups on a ship where the you know the whole thing is doing this and and as the ship is coming down it's really easy because the ship's coming down so so sit-ups are quite easy and then as the ship comes back up then it gets really hard so you, you get quite fit doing that kind of thing and then there's this other thing that no one really thinks about which is just checking in with people it takes longer it sounds really obvious it takes longer to live in an isolated environment all those little things that you're used to doing they take longer and you have to allow time for that you cannot expect like in the outside world we get help, right? We might go and buy a sandwich so we don't have to make the sandwich ourselves. We might have someone else to, to do a task for us because we're in the same office or something like that. We don't have any of that. If in an isolated environment, you have to do everything yourself and it takes a long time. You have to accept that. On the longer expeditions, work out the amount of work you need to do. I keep time. I, I've got a little timer. So I work out how many hours it is and then I stop. I give myself permission to do something else. So there's work and then the work stops and then you can do something else because otherwise if your work environment is your home environment everything just gets blurred together and you feel like you're never properly at work and you're never properly at rest so you have to work out a way to say i'm either doing work or i'm not doing work whatever it is or projects projects that you invent and then there's this thing about helping other people because part of the thing that takes time is you spend more time checking in with people and so you have to check on how they are because that that's all you've got when you're at sea those people in that giant tin can that's it that's all you've got i was on a ship in the north atlantic once where an anthropologist came along to study the scientists and she would bring her notebook out surreptitiously and stuff so you knew if you'd done something interesting because she would start taking notes um and that uh, there was a day when uh, somebody who been on the expedition before and then had done back-to-back -back expeditions. They'd been at the sea for three months, so they were going a bit bonkers. And um, they dressed up as a piece of scientific equipment for Halloween and the notebook came out and she, <laughs> she took notes. But why not, right? You've got a limited number of resources, there's a limit to what you can do. Why not dress up as a piece of scientific equipment? You find the joy in the small things because why not? We don't need some great big comedy show to go and entertain yourselves. You, you, you get better at entertaining yourself with what you've got around you. You know, people do ridiculous things because why not? The Germans took an inflatable palm tree to the North Pole, which is brilliant, it makes everyone smile. Those things that make people smile matter. We had a, a buoy a long, I had a long 11 metre long yellow buoy that was uh, measuring bubbles in big waves. It, it sort of was horizontal when it was on deck and then it, it got lifted into the water and it floated with most of it below the water. And it had this kind of bit that stuck up like a lollipop. And this lollipop bit, we were at sea for six weeks and it started off just as a lollipop. And then somebody got bored at some point, they gave it some eyes uh, and a bit later it got a nose. This is all the insulation tape. And then it, it got whiskers. And then at some point, someone gave it little ears <laughs> made out of expanded polystyrene and insulation tape. And it was brilliant. So having said all that about what it's like at sea, I think often the most interesting question is what it's like when you come back to land. Because I have certainly, and this is absolutely true, been more content at sea than I have ever been on land. Because if you have a good ship, you've got your self-contained little steel village, 
you've got a task to do that's clear, you've got people to work with who you like and who are interesting, you're comfortable from a physical point of view, you know, you've got shelter and food and all that kind of thing. And there's none of the complications of modern life. And it is such a relief to get rid of them. And really, I didn't miss them at all. I, I couldn't have listened to the radio, but I didn't. I didn't listen to podcasts. I didn't miss them. I had all this stuff loaded up. I didn't really watch films. Some people on board did. I didn't miss any of that because life was just simple and it had a purpose and that was good enough. And didn't miss my phone at all. And in fact, when I came back, uh, especially after that trip, the one to the North Pole, came back to civilization, as we call it. And the hard, there were several things that were hard, but they were really interesting to look back at. And, it, you know, when we're all in isolation now, maybe we'll feel some similar things when we transition back to something else. The first thing was that this phone, I hated it. I could, I could barely bear to pick my phone up. I didn't want anything to do with it. And all I could feel was that this was an obstacle between me and anything I wanted to do and anyone I wanted to see. I had to text them or call them. I couldn't just go and speak to them and say, let's go and play table tennis because we had a table tennis table in the Arctic. Um, and it was so frustrating. This, this, you know, this technology is an obstacle, not as a facilitator. And it was also noticeable that I didn't talk <laughs> the same way everyone else talked when I came back. I asked people how they were and I meant it. Because if you're in a an extreme situation, those little things can become big things. If someone's got, you know, a blister on their heel, that is potentially going to become a big problem in several hours time. You need to know about it. So you're talking about the little things all the time. And it's not the content that matters. It's it's the fact that there's contact, that there's a, there's some communication. So now we're looking, you know, here, living in our stuck at home state, we have got video chats to people and we can you know order things online and that's all brilliant but all the fluff that comes off the internet you know you can live without that very nicely and actually life is a lot more relaxing if if all of that just goes away when i first went to see 10 years ago you know the internet was there but it wasn't as much a part of our lives as it is now and so the difference wasn't as big we were still communicating in the more human way and and now the internet's everywhere and actually getting rid of it you have to go to the north pole to get rid of the internet so i have a i guess all of this time at sea you know it is possible the thing i want to leave you with is some optimism that this you know this is possible humans can live like this and uh, in a way the way to look at it i think is that we're all going on an adventure together and whether or not we want to that's the attitude to take this is an expedition we're all going that way in different ways and we've got to get on with it. So so have that approach. Pretend you're living on a 17th century ship if you want, but, but that's the approach to have. Something I haven't talked about is that I highly recommend keeping a diary. And it doesn't have to be, you know, some great big, something that's going to turn into the great tome of the 21st century. But just at the end of every day, just note down what you did, what's going on, what, how you feel about it. And after a lot of days, you will be surprised at how much your opinions change and you know it, things actually did happen it will show you that things did happen and you look back and it's really interesting it's very hard to remember what it was like three weeks ago when you've been living in the same space for far longer than that but having a little diary will help you remember what it felt like and it will help you remember what was happening and it'll help you feel that time is moving on which is really important be tolerant of people you know it might be hard but it but don't complain, be tolerant. It really makes such a difference. There is no reason not to be. It's such a good habit to have. So I highly recommend that one. And, you know, we are all on this adventure together. Uh, we at Fully Charged are, you know, we're here as well, stuck inside, making the best of it. We're on this adventure. But I think that the thing about adventures is that whether or not you want to go on them, you learn something afterwards. And it's an opportunity to have a go at living a bit differently. Even if you go back to where you were, you can play. That's what life is for. Play with the toys. Play with living differently uh, and treat it as an experiment. Thank you so much to all our Patreon supporters. We really, really couldn't do this without you. We really appreciate your help. Uh, as always, there are maybe slightly fewer things than normal on the Fully Charged website, but it is all still carrying on. There are still lots to read. There are loads of archives. There are loads of past podcasts and episodes and all of that stuff. There's probably more than you've had time to read already. So go and catch up with some of that. And if you have been, thank you for watching.